Hi, everyone, and thank you so much for tuning in to this webinar about closed captioning for municipalities. I'm glad you all could join. My name is Regina Valenskaya, and I'm the Director of Marketing here at EEG. I'll be your moderator today. With me on this webinar are Matt Mello, Sales Associate at EEG, and Daniel Krozik, Founder at Municipal Captioning. For the Q&A portion at the end of today's event, we'll be joined by Bill McLaughlin, VP of Product Development at EEG. For today's webinar, Matt and Daniel will be sharing their experience helping municipalities get accessible. You'll find out, out about EEG's closed captioning solutions and how you can use our products for your captioning needs and workflows. I'm now going to welcome Matt and Daniel to kick off the webinar, Closed Captioning for Municipalities. Welcome, Matt and Daniel. Thank you. Thank you for being part of this webinar. Um, could you please start by introducing yourselves and uh, tell us a little bit about what your company does? Uh, Daniel, we'll start with you. Thanks. So my name is Daniel Krasik. I'm the founder of Municipal Captioning, Inc. Uh, I've been working with local government TV channels since 2001. I worked at a couple stations, and then I sold uh, playback systems and transmission systems. And a couple years ago, I started Municipal Captioning, Inc. Uh, what we do is we help cities and counties and other local government examine all of the options from human captioning the traditional ways to using the new AI tools uh, and we give them all the options let them compare them and help them implement them uh, so that they can become compliant with ADA regulations quickly as opposed to taking a long time to compare and contrast and, and implement so um, that's what we do uh, and I've been doing it like I said for about three years Hi all, my name is Matt Mello. I'm with the sales team here at EEG. Uh, for those who aren't familiar with EEG, we can be thought of as sort of a one-stop shop for all things captioning. Uh, we've been a leading manufacturer of broadcast video equipment for decades, helping customers from nearly all industries get compliant with our products. Uh, our equipment and services can be found in most, if not all, major broadcasting facilities around the country, as well as many levels, levels of government agency, ranging from local town halls all the way to entire state legislatures. EEG has a wide range of solutions for SDI, IP, RTMP live stream encoding, as well as live stream, uh, live stream data caption creation. If you're creating any video content, uh, we have the captioning solutions and expertise to ensure that your content is accessible and compliant. Thank you. Um, so the first thing that we're going to be discussing is municipalities and broadcasts. Uh, and the first question I have for the both of you is, how have you seen the nature of broadcasting workflows change because of COVID-19? Daniel, let's start with you. Okay, great, thanks. So um, you know, I work with a lot of local TV stations, some of them very small, and they may have been doing a, a subset of the meetings, the ones that are put to TV, but there's usually a lot of other meetings that have been happening that, that maybe weren't being broadcast. And those folks seem to have been doing not just the same amount of work, but sometimes double or triple the amount of work because they're helping to then get those other meetings on Zoom or Google Meet or whichever ways they're virtualizing it and then often putting those on TV and streaming. So what, I, what I've seen is that uh, COVID-19 has made the folks who are actually running the channels or putting the meetings on air and, and dealing with that workflow uh, have it even more work to do and then a larger audience because more people are watching those meetings. So when I'm hearing from folks reaching out about captioning, it's because they're having even more meetings they're being asked to do in a larger audience and now the, the concern is greater. So I've noticed that broadcasting kind of as a whole has not really changed so much as an industry because of the virus. Uh, but definitely what has changed is broadcasting in relation to municipalities because oftentimes these meetings are held in person and we can't do that anymore. So how are we going to do that is oftentimes it's now through Zoom and we're changing our workflow entirely just to uh, be able to go out to live streams or broadcasts well, over, you know, a virtual network. Sure. Thank you. Um, and Daniel, when adding captioning into broadcasting workflows, mm -hmm. what decisions or adjustments are you noticing that municipalities often have to make? I mean, first off, they're often working within a, a pretty constrained budget. Um, so if they were doing human captioning for just, uh, you know, one core meeting, they're now trying to figure out how they can budget to cover a larger amount of meetings. And they have to determine, are they going to be able to do 30 hours in a month or 45 hours in a month, 60 hours in a month, or are they going to be able to cover everything that they're doing on their, their local channel? So, so they're really looking at how much they have to do. And then there's, you know, factors on like whether they want to do it locally or in the cloud. Um, but there's, they're usually starting out by trying to figure out how much they have to cover to be compliant. Sure, sure. So one of the big things 
um, that I've noticed you have to look at when you're starting to consider adding captioning is where do you want the captions to be embedded? At what point in the signal flow do you want them to be added? So you can do it downstream from the RTMP encoding, you can do it upstream, you could do it, you know, if you're doing broadcast. So you really want to think about like what, um, where you would like these captions embedded before going anywhere else. Um, and you've got to think of things like, is it going to fit into what I have currently? So I need, do I need to add or replace any hardware or software into this workflow to, for captions to be added in general? And another question for you, what should be considered when researching solutions? Daniel? Um, so obviously the things that need to be considered are what your local needs are and how those compare. So uh, things like quality. Obviously, you want to be able to have the highest quality you can get. And to get that higher quality, you need to be able to have word models where you can put in the names of your local counselor or your mayor so that those key things are accurate or, or acronyms. So those are things to look at. Um, also, you know, looking at, uh, at whether it's going to be held locally or in the cloud for, for you know, whether your data is going to be something that's only in your hands or something that's, that's out there, if that's a concern. Um, but really, I mean, the, the big thing I think that comes down to folks is trying to figure out what they need to do to stay uh, compliant with ADA regulations and how they can best accomplish that while meeting the quality expectations of, of their local community. Sure. So I had some of the same points as Daniel here. So I, a lot of the things are going to be like, while you're going into it, you have to consider, are you looking for an AI uh, captioning solution? Or are you looking for a live captioner? Uh, like about how many months are you, I'm sorry, how many hours per month are you looking to do uh, of captioning? Just so you have an idea going into it so you can come to us and have, you know, uh, a good idea of what we can give you on like pricing and things like that. Um, all these things are a good thing to keep in mind when looking at adding to live captions. Um, after the webinar, I'll be happy to discuss any sort of pricing information that you're looking for for any of these uh, solutions. So we're going to start off this webinar with a general overview of what the captioning process looks like. Um, you're going to get, see a few slides with this sort of breakdown throughout the presentation. So it's a good idea to get familiar with this sort of workflow. This present, uh, this particular chart uses the HD 492 hardware encoder or Alta IP encoder as an example. To get captions added, the video will be passed through an encoder. The audio is sent over our caption delivery network called I ICAP. And the audio is received by either Lexi or a captioning agency of your choice. Uh, most major captioning agencies have access to ICAP, and if they don't, they can feel free to contact us uh, for a download of the necessary software. Once the caption data is created, it can then be sent back to the encoder to be embedded into the signal. So after the last slide, you're probably wondering what Lexi is and how it can be used as an alternative to a human captioner. Lexi is EEG's automatic speech recognition system capable of creating uh, caption data in English, Spanish, and French. This webinar has actually been captioned by Lexi if you'd like to see it in action. Um, Lexi is a cloud hosted service and can be accessed by any of EEG's encoders with very little setup. Lexi has very low latency uh, with captions appearing approximately two to three seconds after it was set on stream. It can be accessed from any EEG encoder again, so any that we mentioned today, Lexi will work with. The base accuracy of Lexi starts at approximately 90% and this could be increased by having a single speaker with clear audio and also by using Lexi's topic models feature. So topic models are a great tool that can help Lexi understand what is trying to be said and can help improve overall accuracy from the base of 90% during your programs. Lexi's topic models are especially useful in cases where names, industry specific jargon, and terms that may not be found in the dictionary are spoken. A common example here for municipalities can be uh, names of the local mayor or nearby park names. Users can select EEG's developer topic models or generate their own by supplying Lexi with word libraries or relevant URLs. This feature enables Lexi to recognize topics and immerse itself in uh, distinctive vocabulary and observes context through absor absorption of relevant web data. Lexi on its own is available in English, Spanish, and French, but if you're looking to expand your reach, ICAP Translate can translate caption data to and from eight major languages at very affordable rates. Lexi Leash is a free tool that gives you more control over your Lexi jobs, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. Here we can see a screenshot of the, of the dashboard for uh, Lexi's topic model manager. This is where you can, can manage all of your uh, custom topic models and choose a core model. EEG has several core models that can be selected as a topical base vocabulary, which can give Lexi a greater understanding of the discussion at hand. For any municipalities watching here, we have a core model with over a thousand entities and phrases geared towards government and legislative uh, purposes that, might, that you might find particularly useful. From there, you can import your own uh, words and URLs for Lexi to learn from. 
A great use of this feature is to upload, upload names of nearby towns, names of commonly mentioned people, and any other local information that may be referenced often. Lexi's topic models are a very simple way uh, to customize Lexi into what you need to uh, get out of captioning. ICAP Translate is an easy and affordable way to bring greater accessibility to a larger audience. This service will allow you to take captions created by either Lexi or a captioning agency and translate them to or from English, Spanish, French, Italian, Portuguese, German, Danish, and Maori. This means that viewers of broadcasts or live streams can follow along with their content, even without understanding the program language, allowing for a broader audience, which can also help increase viewership. As mentioned before, here's a screen cap of the Lexi Leash interface. Lexi Leash is a free Windows application that makes managing Lexi jobs easier. This tool was created in consideration of organizations who may not be staffed with experts in the captioning and production field, so it may be very beneficial for them to easily track Lexi usage quotas, monitor current jobs, restart similar previous jobs, and prevent accidental overage charges. So now let's move into on-premise. This question is for Matt. Could you tell us the main differences and some similarities between broadcast use and in-room meetings? Sure, so much of the workflow between live captioning and broadcast for in-room presentations is actually very similar, uh, but the equipment used can be certainly different uh, depending on what you're looking to accomplish. Oftentimes, if you're looking to display captions in the presentation room, you'll be searching for a caption decoder rather than an encoder. Our HD 492 encoder act, uh, also has the ability to do code captions on the video output uh, for open caption display, but we also have a more specialized equipment that, will, that allows for much more customization, which we'll get to in just a few minutes. And question for the both of you, uh, how do you recommend municipalities determine whether they should adopt cloud or on-premises solutions? And as a follow-up, what workflows do you recommend for each? Uh, Matt, what are your thoughts? So cloud solutions versus on-premise solutions are going to come down to mostly a couple of key things. Um, are you able co to configure your current setup to allow for new inbound and outbound connections? Um, what type of licensing works best for your company? Do you have the co uh, caption con, I'm sorry, do you need your caption content to have the utmost security? Things like that are gonna be all things that we ask you, um, whether you're debating going cloud versus on-premise. And Daniel? Sure, so um, one way I help people look at their workflow is, are you looking at something where there's a person whose job it is to start and stop for the meetings? And in those cases, you're gonna to wanna to use, let's say a cloud solution where you're paying for a certain number of hours. But if you're looking for something where it's just running 24 seven, just like your actual broadcast transmitter is, and everything going in is getting captioned and going out so that it's no one's actual responsibility to start and stop, that might cost more upfront to get that and get that in an on-prem solution, but then you have less operating cost of it being somebody's uh, staff hours. And in some places, there's only one person or one and a half hour, uh, you know, people worth of time. So one thing I ask people to consider is, do you want to make that a all the time 24 seven captioning, which leans towards doing it on premises or do it only a fixed number of hours in the cloud, which is a different way of doing it. And both are valid. Just depends on what your city or county and really what the attorneys feel is going to best cover your liabilities under the ADA. A lot of stations felt like because they uh, didn't fall under the FCC size requirements, they were safe. They didn't have to deal with captioning because the FCC wasn't pushing them. But the ADA is something that they do have to, uh, you know, provide effective civic communication. And captions are one of the most popular ways to do that. So what they, I really recommend before they decide exactly what to do is look at their budget, but also look at what the attorneys for the city and the county feel is the most effective way to, to cover their liability. Great response. Uh, and Daniel, what, what are municipalities' main concerns when captioning in-room meetings? Oh, sure. For in-room meetings, latency is huge. They don't want to have it display 45 seconds later, 35 seconds later. I know with television, a lot of times we might be used to seeing a, a lot of latency when uh, you know, you're know watching a professional sports game or news and it's not right along. But with in-room meetings, definitely having a short latency is, is really crucial so that the people who are there following along in person can follow along as best as possible. Sure. So, so my my biggest thing uh, for for their concerns has been um, where you can actually place the captions. Because oftentimes, when you have like you know a room with one screen in it, that that screen is actually going to be used for a presentation or something similar to that. Um, so that's a big thing: is is how am I actually going to add captions to an in-room meeting at all? Um, and another common concern is how is everybody going to be able to see the captions? So if you um, 
if how how are they going to see a captions in in which what size room they're in? So they want to make sure that everybody has the same accessibility to be able to see captions um, equally throughout the same room space. And Matt, how how do you think visuals play a role for municipalities? Sure. So visuals in uh, in a me in a meeting provide greater understanding of the of the topic being discussed because many people are actually visual learners and can benefit from having a presentation to follow along to. Uh, additionally, for people who are deaf or hard of hearing, uh, visuals can be an invaluable tool for understanding the topic being discussed. Captioning also falls into this category of understanding for visual learners and people who are hard of hearing. So that's going to bring us into um, Lexi Local. So EEG's uh, biggest priorities lately has been adding accessibility options to local settings and meetings. As everybody begins, begins to move back into the office, we're going to start seeing a resurgence of in-person meetings at every level of government. If you're looking to create a completely on-premise solution for broadcast, live stream, or for in-room productions, then Lexi Local can be an ideal choice. Lexi Local offers the same performance and accuracy as the cloud-based version of Lexi, but it's completely on-premise and works with any cloud without any cloud connectivity, excuse me. A big advantage of Lexi Local is that it provides complete internal control of data flow and it never touches a cloud, which is perfect for any content featuring classified or sensitive information. This is a rack mount unit, which, is, which can be placed into your facility and used on, on, on a limited basis. If you're captioning a large amount of content and are also worried about the month-to-month -month billing of other captioning methods, then LexiLocal may be the perfect solution with its annual unlimited licensing model. Here you can see a captioning workflow, including a Lexi Local unit. Um, you'll notice that the Lexi Local replaces the captioner or cloud version of Lexi, and the HD 492 will receive caption data directly from the Lexi Local server that it's plugged into. To say it again, there's no internet connection required to add captions with Lexi Local. This example actually, uh, also shows that from here, you can send the caption video to both a broadcast stream and to the AV610 caption decoder for an in-room display. So everything you need to operate a basic captioning system is included on the Lexi Local server. You can connect multiple encoders to Lexi Local, and if you need to run more than one channel of live captioning, there are additional costs to run multiple channels simultaneously, but you don't need ex any extra pieces of hardware. You can also connect the system to custom topic model data, which is stored entirely locally. To connect to external captioners, you can also use dialing cards or a customer supplied VPN. So as I've been alluding to in the last few slides, EEG has a product that we've created specifically for in-room presentations called the AV610 Caption Port. The AV610 is a caption decoder that allows you to add, cap, uh, add open captions to over your video output, as well as simply display captions in the presentation room. It also has the ability to scale any vi input video down by 15%, allowing for a dedicated space to place captions and not interfere with any images. The AV610 is compatible with any source of iCap, including Lexi, and accepts character sets not supported by a standard caption encoder. It can be can also be configured to receive captions over RS-232, Telnet, and optional modem. So one way of using the AV610 in an in-room setting is with the video scaler, which allows you to add captions without interfering with the video. The AV610 can be configured to uh, can, can be, excuse me can be configured to scale the video, and allow for a room above or below the presentation space depending on which works better for the environment that it's in. It takes SDI in and outputs SDI, which is going to be converted to HDMI for screen displays if necessary. Another workflow for the AV610 is the ability to make a larger text display with a static image, so you don't need to uh, you don't need an input source of SDI video at all. You'd upload the image before the event, a logo of your organization or conference, for example, and the AV610 will generate its own output video signal from its internal processor. This is a simple way to add accessibility options to any meeting. And that brings us into live streaming. Uh, Daniel, what are some unique ways you've seen municipalities adapt to the need to move meetings and events online? Sure, I mean, one big thing I've seen is that they've often had to use multiple platforms They've had folks who may be already been using Zoom, and now they're doing some meetings with Zoom, and then they're trying other things in Google Meet and, uh, and other platforms. And then they're also working to add captioning because they want to have that also be compliant. So, uh, you know, the folks running these channels, these uh, unsung heroes, have had to not only find ways to get these stream meetings onto their channels, they also need to look for ways to get captioning into those stream meetings. 
Sure. So there's definitely obviously been a huge push to move everything virtual due to COVID. And municipalities have obviously been no exception to that. Uh, many municipalities have um, have been doing everything in person, have been quickly forced to adapt to the online world. Uh, most meetings are now held on Zoom, obviously, and other platforms, with some of these meetings actually being pushed out to broadcast as well as a replacement for standard board meetings. Adaptation of streaming has become more widespread due to COVID, and many of the organizations who have not had to use any live streaming before uh, may now have a better understanding of it moving forward um, and how they can utilize it. And this question is for you both. What are the, a few reasons municipalities don't take advantage of adding closed captioning to their streams? Uh, Matt, let's hear from you first. Sure, so I would imagine that the biggest factor, factor would be unfamiliarity with adding any captioning to a live stream because uh, it might seem like a daunting task if you've never done live streaming at all. However, it, adding captions is actually not as difficult as some might think uh, for a live stream. Also, some people might be under the impression that their video player of choice doesn't suppose, support closed captions, uh, but we actually have a solution that will work with a majority of popular streaming platforms. And Daniel? Sure, so one thing I hear a lot when I'm talking to, to folks who run the local channel, the, the public access channels, or actually the school or government channels, uh, is that they, they think that they're not required to because they're of a size that the FCC limits uh, don't really apply to. And that's uh, a, a way that people have kind of made themselves feel better about the fact that it seemed too expensive, uh, it seemed too complicated, it just seemed out of reach. But uh, what, what I think that they start to realize as they hear, as the city attorneys and county attorneys talk to their peers and find out about other cities and counties where they've been sued and where very expensive ADA lawsuits have started uh, because of, of the lack of captioning, uh, they're starting to realize that all of them are required under the ADA to do this. If it's a city channel or a school channel, it, it's directly required. If it's a public access channel working on behalf of the city and putting the city's meetings up, then it's required you know, to do that on behalf of the city. So uh, I think this, the, the main thing is people aren't realizing how much liability they have that they would have to address. Uh, because as they figure that out, that really prompts them to reach out and say, hey, I need to figure out a solution or, or what that costs and how I would do that. And another question for you, Daniel, which des destinations are you most often seeing municipalities streaming to? So a lot of folks here are streaming to the big tech destinations, you know, they're streaming to uh, YouTube or by Google or they're streaming to Facebook. Um, and then they've got their own platforms, uh, you know, the city channel might go out through their playback system, uh, it might go straight to a Wowza server, uh, might go to Vimeo. So there's, there's a, a range uh, of different platforms. Uh, what I am seeing mostly is that it's no longer something where they say, well, we only stream to this one place. They almost all are using two or three platforms or at least testing different platforms. Yeah, same here. It's all been, it's been pretty much the big platforms that you see regularly. You'll see Facebook Live, you'll see YouTube Live. Uh, Vimeo and even Twitch nowadays. So really, how do you go about adding captions to these live streams? So we actually have a streaming platform uh, called Falcon, which is the perfect solution to this problem. Falcon's gonna act as the middleman between your streaming start point and the live streaming platform of your choice. You point your stream to us, add captions, and then point Falcon to the Content Delivery Network or CDN. Falcon is compatible with most major streaming platforms such as YouTube Live, Facebook Live, Twitch, Vimeo, Vbook, like we mentioned more. Um, you'll, we've seen a lot of new interest in Falcon lately, as the ma majority of uh, captioning agencies recognize that Falcon is the easiest and most seamless way to uh, caption live streams. Falcon can be purchased and managed completely through our cloud site at eegcloud.tv. Here's another very similar looking diagram that I'm sure we're all getting familiar with. Uh, in this example, Falcon sits between the streaming media encoder and streaming platform. The live video source and program audio are uplinked to the cloud using RTMP through a streaming encoder, whether that's AWS Elemental, Telestream Wirecast, OBS, or similar. Uh, you can then also use a, you could also use a hardware streaming encoder if you'd like, such as the Azure Hilo. Uh, your program audio is then captioned, again, either by a live captioner or by Lexi, uh, and live caption data is returned to Falcon right away and embedded into the stream. So very similar to any of our hardware-based methods, only without any additional hardware required added to, to add captions. We also have an HTTP version of Falcon available uh, for any platforms that have a se separate HTTP uplink specifically for captions. Let's take Zoom, for example. Uh, instead of sending an RTMP stream through Falcon and having uh, captions added to it, you have a separate HTTP link uh, that only the caption text is sent to. So if you're the presenter or organizer for the meeting or event, 
you can get the link by going to the CC display at the bottom of the window and retrieving that URL, which is typically unique for each Zoom meeting. So with this method, you can have caption data added directly within a Zoom chat, again, with no additional hardware required. So Falcon is our solution to live captions. Uh, let's move into post-production content. Uh, Matt, what has been your experience helping municipalities who had a backlog of videos uh, and needed to get uh, accessible as quickly as possible? Sure, absolutely. So uh, captioning VOD and backlog content is an ent entirely different concept than captioning live streams. And I think it's important to know it's very different products for each. But there have been times where we've been asked what the best way to add captioning to older content is. And of course, we do have products that quickly and automatically add captions in a post-production format as well. Generally, when we run into these situations, it's people who have a lot of older content to caption and they need something simple and quick to do the job. And Daniel, once an organization has actually caught up on captioning their backlogged content, what solutions or method do you recommend that they adopt to ensure that they continue to stay compliant? Yeah, again, I mean, the biggest thing, I think, is to make sure that uh, the, the attorneys from the city or the ADA commission or, or, you know, depending on the size of the local entity, they have different folks who are looking at this, but that they uh, work with them and determine that, yes, we need to do all of the meetings or at least all the public-facing meetings or we need to have all the meetings and every uh, civic promotional video or every press release video. Some, some cities have been... Uh, very consistent at having ASL uh, interpreters at every COVID-related press release event. Others have struggled to have that. Um, some are thinking that they want to have captioning at every single event that the, the city is holding because they want to be covered. Others feel that that might not be. So really, it's, it's making sure that they see all the opportunities and, and that they're identifying them. So EG's solution to captioning VOD and backlog content is called Scribe. Scribe is a Windows-based post-production application, which can make getting caught, up on, uh, getting caught up both easy and affordable. For VOD content, you can upload transcripts or automatically generate transcripts with Lexi and create a, a timed caption file uh, output at a fraction of the real-time video length. You can also edit any existing captions alongside the video on a timeline, allowing for easy and quick fixes. We also have a product that can work in conjunction with Scribe called CC Play File Pro which gives you the ability to stitch the caption file to the video once it's created. Once your caption files are created, you can submit them to the EEG Cloud website for a full QC check against the video asset, which checks for spelling errors, frame, risk, frame rate mismatches, uh, caption timing, and more. Issues found are highlighted for you, so you can perform a quick fix before publishing. Along with all of our other software and cloud-based products, Scribe can be demoed for free from our website, and feel free to contact me after the webinar to get started here. So this is a dashboard. This is the screenshot of the Scribe interface. Uh, so you can get an idea of what working in this environment looks like. Note the text bucket at the bottom as well as the ASR button, uh, Lexi ASR button at the top. The Lexi ASR feature within Scribe works very quickly, creating uh, captions from the program audio in approximately one third of the time of the program. In addition to Lexi, Scribe also allows you to import uh, transcripts to be aligned, QC'd, and exported as a caption file or stitched to the video with a CC Play File Pro bundle. Uh, Scribe is very simple to use and also provides a seamless workflow for anybody looking to add captions in a post-production setting. So that about uh, wraps up our webinar portion. I believe we have time for a Q&A now, Regina. Yeah, so we have now reached the Q&A portion of the webinar um, and we will, um, uh, we will also be introducing Bill McLaughlin, the VP of Product Development for EEG. Um, so if you have any questions and you haven't already done so, please enter them into the Q&A tool at the bottom of your Zoom window. So uh, the very first question that we have is, can you choose to use Lexi Local for one event, but a live captioner via ICAP for a different event? Yeah, so you can do that actually uh, with Lexi Local, and then if you have your HD 492 encoder, also they can they can uh, connect via ICAP to the HD 492 encoder, or you can do it through the Lexi Local unit uh, with a VPN bill, I believe. Yeah, it just um, if you want to connect to the encoder, if you want to switch the connection between the local only network and the remote network with ICAP, that's an encoder configuration that you would switch on per event basis but yeah you can you can basically use you can either use a captioner that's in the network 
you know, through the Lexi local box without going out to the cloud, or you can reconfigure the encoder to talk to the cloud and use a captioner through the cloud. Uh, we have another question asking if, uh, regarding translation, if we provide ASL to captioning, uh, to captioning uh, use case would be if the speaker is deaf and presenting in ASL, for example. Oh, that would be cool. Um, uh, no, the, the technology I don't think uh, is really there yet to um, kind of take that you know, take a video, say, of a sign language speaker and to really be able to understand that and to translate into words. I mean, that would certainly be a very cool technology. Um, you know, it's interesting to see generally how uh, sign language and captioning, um, you know, for, for some members of the audience, these are going to overlap in functionality. Um, so, some people, especially, you know, obviously uh, deaf individuals who have been doing ASL for a long time are going to prefer that to captioning. Um, on the other hand, there's a lot of individuals and in, in audiences who uh, really don't know ASL well or at all and who are going to um, benefit more from captioning. So uh, sometimes it presents as a little bit of an either or, I think, which one are we going to do? Um, but I think it's important to understand that they kind of both have their unique benefits. Um, there are times when both is the right answer. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of a question of, of exactly who the audience is and what, you know, what percentage of the audience that wants the captioning is going to, you know, understand um, sign language or be better served by a sign language interpreter. Thank I don't you. know if you want to add to that, Daniel. <laughs> Um, so, so those are all the questions that we have received. Um, just want to give a huge thanks to Matt, Daniel, and Bill for sharing your insight today. And thank you so much for all the, uh, to all the attendees for joining us for closed captioning for municipalities. If you have any questions about EEG, municipal captioning, or any of the topics that we discussed today, you can reach out to Ma Matt, Daniel, or me. Uh, within the next few days, you will receive an email from me with a link to the recording of today's event, as well as information about upcoming webinars. So thank you all again, and have a great rest of your week. Thank you. You guys did a great job. Thank you.